Revelation 6 and 7, is the opening of those seals. Every time Jesus peels back a seal, there's a vision. Every time Jesus takes off one of the seals, there is a special vision that correlates to that seal. That's Revelation 6 and 7. You can see the, the flow of it. It makes perfectly good chronological sense. It's not to say that the book of Revelation is entirely chronological. In fact, it's not entirely chronological. That's one of the reasons that people have trouble with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not written chronologically. It's written thematically. It's based on themes more than chronology, and we'll spend time on that. Revelation 6 and 7, Jesus, the glorified Christ, begins to peel back those seals, and vision after vision after vision comes. And then we get to Revelation 8 and 9. And the trumpets begin to blow, the trumpets of judgment. The great shofar is sounded. What do you think of that? I can play the trumpet, but I didn't want to scare you. And uh, the, the, the trumpet sounds, and these uh, uh, horrific judgments begin to fall. So well, what are those judgments and what are those trumpets? It's Christ that is issuing these things. Christ is at the center of it. Are there judgments? Sure there are, but it's Christ who's issuing them. It's Christ who's at the center. And the judgments flow out. In Revelation chapter 10, we find this angel who looks exactly like Christ in Revelation chapter 1. Many Bible expositors believe it is Jesus, a messenger, and he returns and he puts one foot on the sea and he puts one foot on the land and he lifts his hand to heaven and he swears that there will be time or delay no longer. He has a little scroll in his hand, a remarkable, remarkable prophecy. Revelation chapter 11, we find these two witnesses. Two witnesses that, that, that could call down fire from heaven and a witness that, that could cause plagues to fall and then the witnesses are slain. Who are they witnesses of? Jesus Christ. These things do not exist in a vacuum. Even the witnesses were testifying of Christ and they're slain. And then Revelation chapter 12 and 13 is the undisputed climax of the book of Revelation. Here we find Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, the glorified Christ, in direct conflict and combat with the enemy. In Revelation chapter 12, he's in conflict with the dragon. Verse 9 says that dragon that deceives the whole world is the devil and Satan. Here we find Jesus locked in almost hand-to-hand -hand combat with his arch enemy. You say, well, who is this dragon? Who is this devil? Where did he come from? You've got to keep coming to the meetings. That's exactly what we're going to talk about. Revelation 13, this beast that we've already talked about, the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and these ten horns, and Jesus in direct conflict, the people of God in direct conflict with these satanic anti-Christian powers. Revelation chapter 14, we see these three angels streaking through the midnight heavens. Three very special, important messages. The first message is, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. And these angels have special messages that point us to guess who, everyone? Just guess. Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. Revelation chapter 14 ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Powerful, unimaginable, unfathomable glory that will be. Revelation 15 all the way through 19. Jesus in chapter 19 is depicted as riding on a great white stallion. The Bible says he has on his vesture a name, King of Kings, and say it with me, Lord of Lords. He's the Word of God. He's clothed in a garment dipped in blood and he returns victorious over his enemies. That imagery comes directly from an, uh, an ancient practice. When one army had been defeated, the general of the victorious army would get on a white stallion and he would ride victoriously across the battlefield on that white stallion. That's exactly what we find in Revelation 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 as Christ gets the victory over his self-styled opposers. Revelation chapter 20, Christ takes that nail-scarred hand and lays it directly on the hand of Satan and binds him and throws him into a pit. Here we find Christ in, in direct conflict with his arch enemy. And that is awesome. I cannot wait to get to Revelation chapter 20. And then, Revelation chapter 21, the best of all, we see the new Jerusalem. The Bible says there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more disease, no more terrorism. Someone say amen. amen. What's the focus of the new Jerusalem? It's not a city. It's not gold streets. It's not gold walls. It's who's in that city, and that is Jesus. Amen. All the way through the book of Revelation, the whole focus is Jesus. 
from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22, we can understand this book. We can understand Bible prophecy, but we're going to need two keys. Number one, we're going to need the key that says the Old Testament is the foundation of the book of Revelation. And number two, we're going to need the key that says the focus of this book is not dragons. The focus of this book is not the Antichrist. The focus of this book is not all of this mystical imagery. The focus of this book is who? Say it with me now. Jesus Christ. You say amen? amen. All right. Is your appetite whetted? All right. Well, we're done for tonight. <laughs> We're going to close with a word of prayer. We're going to turn you loose tomorrow night. I want to let you know something. I want to make you a promise. We want to be very sensitive to your time. Are you busy? Anybody here busy? Okay, I'm busy. Here's what's going to happen. I want to let you know. I'm not whistling Dixie up here. These meetings are going to start at 7 o'clock sharp. 7 sharp. So don't think, well, I'll show up at 7.10. You show up at 7.10, you miss the first 10 minutes of the meetings. You show up at 7 o'clock sharp, this meeting is going to last about 55 minutes, and you can walk out of here most nights by 8 o'clock. Sound like a good idea? So you can still get home and eat your meal and see the game, whatever you want. But beloved, we are going to be here responsibly, carefully studying God's holy word. I want to give you a personal invitation to be with us as many nights as you can, and I'll let you know. I don't gain anything from you being here except the fellowship of good Christian brothers and sisters. But you will gain a lot from being here. Do whatever you can. Change your schedule. Manipulate your schedule. Adjust your schedule. If you cannot make it on certain nights, no problem. We'll have audio CDs available every single night for a nominal fee. Again, that money doesn't go to me. That money goes to defray the expenses, the expenses of this event. You are all invited as my personal guests to come, to bring family members, to bring friends, and to go on a journey with us as we discover prophecy. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we have just spent a few moments together tonight trying to unlock a few of the mysteries of Revelation. And Father, we've seen tonight that it is not some mysterious book that is incomprehensibly difficult to understand. No, no, no. In fact, tonight, just with two keys in our hands, we've already begun to unlock some of the marvelous mysteries of this book. Father, I want to pray for every person here, unique people, special people, people that you love. Father, there are people here tonight with challenges, people here with frustrations, people here with needs. Father, minister to every person that is here and their families. And Father, bring them back, not to my glory, but to your glory. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.